Hello friends, thank you for watching this video. I am Muhammad and today we'll be creating a microservice with .NET 5. So, what's on our agenda for today? We're gonna first discuss the ingredients, what tool do we need that in order for us to create that microservice. Then we're gonna be actually creating that microservice. Then we're gonna see how are we gonna be able to interact with that service endpoint. And then we're gonna be managing the configuration and secrets that that service gonna be relying on for it to work. Then we're gonna be discussing the error handling and how we can make sure that everything runs smoothly even if the application fails. And then we're gonna be discussing how we can add health checks so we can make sure that the service is running as it should be. And finally, we're gonna be adjusting the logs in order for it to work on development and production. So we're gonna have a different version for lo of logs for development and a different version of logs for production. As always, you'll be able to find the source code in the description down below. Please like, share, and subscribe if you like this video. It will really help the channel. So now for the ingredients. We're gonna be needing two things. Visual Studio Code and .NET 5 SDK. So Visual Studio Code and .NET 5 are both free. You can download them through the links available on the screen or in the description down below. Now, let's get started. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that .NET Core SDK has been installed successfully. In order for us to do that, we're gonna type the following command, .NET dash dash version. And as we can see, we have the latest version of the .NET Core SDK installed on the machine, which is 5.0.201. You can see any different number on your machine, which is be fine. But if you see any errors, please download, redownload, and reinstall the .NET Core SDK, .NET 5 SDK. Now let's start by creating our application. We're going to be utilizing the .NET new keyword, so it's going to be .NET new web API. And we're gonna call it sample service. And we're gonna uh, give it the no HTTPS parameters because we don't really wanna configure the HTTPS right now. If you wanna use it with HTTPS, you can remove this parameter. And now this should take a few seconds to load. And we can see it has been created successfully. Now let's open it with our code editor. Perfect, now we have our code editor open and we can utilize it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna be adding our opening the terminal and building the application. So all we need to do is go to view and we can select terminal. And then from here, what we can do is we can write .NET build. We make sure that the application is building successfully. Perfect. And the second one is we're gonna put .NET run just to make sure if it's running. Perfect, we can see it's running on port 5000. Perfect, now let's stop this. The second step is we're gonna be configuring our API. So we're gonna be building a microservice that's gonna be reading the cryptocurrencies prices. So in order for us to do that, we're gonna be utilizing a free online tool that's available for us, which is gonna be the WorldCoin Index. So let's look for that. And then once we visit this, let's go to, I think it's forward slash API service. Yes, perfect. So we can see here that we have a simple API which gets, uh, which, uh, which uh, we send basically the command and it gives us back the prices of Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum here based on a currency that we have selected. And if we go all the way down, we can see that it will provide us with a key. If you don't see the key directly here, all you need to do is click on generate key and it will generate the key for you. So what are we going to do first is we're going to copy this key. We're going to just keep it inside our source code for now. Or we can leave it here. Let's, let's put it somewhere just for reference. And then we can change it back later on. So let's put it somewhere here inside our... Let's just put it here, key. Uh, let's put it inside. Let's create a new variable, we'll call it key for now, and then we're just gonna, this is a temporary one, we're gonna be removing it. And the second step is we're gonna just 
discuss how the API is gonna work. So we can see here that this is the URL that we need to send. It's compromised of a key, a label, as well as the fiat currency that we wanna see it in. Okay, perfect. So let's try this with Postman and we can see what do we, what do we get from that? So in Postman, first let us copy that URL and then we can update. So it's gonna require a key and fiat. So let's copy the key that we have just generated, which is this one. And we'll update it within Postman. And then let's, let us send the request and see what do we get. Great. So once we send that request, we, uh, we are able to see that the API returned a 200 with the body of it, which returning the Ethereum price and Litecoin price based on Bitcoin. So let's see if we change that, for example, to USD. Perfect. We can see the price has shifted from Bitcoin to USD. Great. So now that we have, we know that what's our API and which is uh, the URL. So we can see it's a get request. It's calling the worldcoinindex.com forward slash API service forward slash ticker. And it required three parameters, which is the key, label, and fiat. Let us see if we can get the Bitcoin price as well. So we can put BTC, BTC. Let's see if this will work. Perfect. We can see here that we got the actual price of Bitcoin. And today is 58,656, which is good. Okay, great. So now that we have this, now let us go back to our Visual Studio Code and let us start building our application. So within Visual Studio Code, the first thing that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be adding the service settings. And the service settings basically is uh, gonna be mapping all of the services that we need, all of the keys and secret that we want from the app settings. So to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new folder inside the root directory and we're going to call it configuration and inside this configuration folder we're going to create a new class and we're going to call it service settings great so inside the service settings basically we're going to have two properties the first property is going to be the url that we want to we want the api to call our service to call so property string and we're going to call this coins price url perfect and the other one is going to be the api key that we have generated so a string and it's going to be the api key great so once we have that now let's update our app settings in order for us to take advantage of this so inside our app settings we're going to delete this we don't really want it now and we're going to be creating a new one called service settings this is triple T's. Okay, great. And then here, we're going to add a comma. It's going to take only the, we called it, I think, yes, coins price URL. So let's take this and we'll, we'll put it here. And here we can provide the actual URL and just make sure this is correct. Copy it and put it here. Okay, great. Now let's go back to our postman. And let's take the URL. I think it's we're gonna take all of this. Okay. And we're gonna paste it here. Great. So that's the URL. So as a rule, uh, as a golden rule of development, we should never, never ever put the client secrets here. So how are we gonna add it and how are we gonna let the application know about it? In order for us to do that, we're going to be utilizing something that does not provide for us, which is called the user secrets. And the user secrets basically is like, a, it's going to be thinking of it as like a secret key value pair that the .NET application will store inside our local machine right now, which is going to be storing all of the secrets that we give it to it. But when it, do, when it comes to deploying this application, for example, if we deploy it to Azure, we can use, for example, the Azure Key Vault and we can store everything from there and we can link it to our service, for example. So locally right now, we're gonna be utilizing the user secrets. And in order for us to do that, we're gonna be typing .NET user dash secrets in it. 
So basically, we're just initializing the user secret to uh, our application. So if we go here to the sample service.cs proj, we can see that this user secret ID has already been initialized for us for this application. Perfect. The next step is we're going to be adding the API key that we want. So how do we add that? So we're going to put dot .NET user dash secrets set and then we're going to give it the same format as here so as you can see here we have service settings and then we have the coin price url for the api we're going to have service settings and then we're going to have the api key how do we do that it's very simple we're going to just do service settings and the colon here makes as if like a sub level of it and we're going to call it the api key and then we're going to actually paste the API key that we have. Let's copy paste it from here. Copy it. And let's paste it here. Okay, great. And then after we do that, all we need to do is simply just click on enter and it will be stored. So let's click on enter. And we can see that the service settings .api has been stored successfully. Great. So right now, this service settings is mapping automatically to the service settings that we have here, which is what we want. But how will the .NET application know about it? In order for us to inform our application that we have a service setting here and we have some user secrets here that, and we want to map it to the service settings class that we have just created, we need to update our startup class. And inside our startup class, what we can do is very easy. So inside our configure service methods all we need to do is write services dot configure so basically we are configuring the service the we basically we're adding some configuration to the dot not core app the dot not five application that we have informing it that we have some configuration inside our app settings and inside our user secret that it needs to take into consideration while running so we're gonna pass here the service settings Let's fix the references for this and then basically we're just going to tell it where to look for it and basically we're going to be utilizing the configuration dot get section and then the simplest way to do is to get the name of of the service settings and that's it so right now once our uh, application starts inside the configuration dot not will automatically knows that it needs to link those service settings class that we have here with the configuration that we have added inside our app settings and inside the app secrets sorry inside the user secrets that we have created great so once we have done that the next step is for us to create some uh, to add a package that will allow us to do some http calls directly to our api in order for us to do that, we're going to be utilizing the REST Sharp package. So how do we add it? It's very simple as well. All we need to do is dot .NET add package and we'll call it REST. Its name is REST Sharp. And enter. This should take a few seconds and perfect. It has been added successfully and we can check that by going to the sample service the CS approach and we can see that the rest sharp package has been added great so the next step after that is we're going to be creating the interface for our api client so in order for us to do that inside our root folder we're going to create a new folder we're going to call it services and then we're going to be creating a new interface we're going to call it the i api service api client let's call it and then inside this uh, interface, uh, we're going to be returning, let's start with void and then we can update it later on. And we're going to say connect to API. Or yeah, connect to API. And we're going to basically just pass different currencies in order for us to get the price in different currencies at a certain, um, certain time. So we're going to pass it the currency. Okay, great. Now let's create our API client. So inside the service, we're going to create a new class. We're going to call it API client. 
and then we're going to be implementing that interface that we have which is i api client and then it's going to tell us that we need to implement the interface perfect now let's delete this we don't need it and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be defining the service settings here so in order for us to access the url that we want to send to and the keys that we have so how do we do that we're going to just put private read only service settings and we'll call it service we'll call it settings and let's fix the references perfect so now let's create the constructor so and then let's initialize this and this is gonna be we're gonna be utilizing the i options for it so i option and let's fix the references and then basically underscore settings equal settings great so now we have that the next step for us okay I th sorry settings dot value perfect so after we have added this uh we're gonna start by creating our function so just that, that before we do that let us just explain how is this able even possible here uh, basically once we did that in the startup class we added the service and we configured it asp.net here what did it do it was very smart about it it added this service settings into our dependency injection so what that means is it the, all of the values that it have gotten on the initialization from the app settings and the user secrets had added it to the uh, DI container and through that DI container whenever we initialize the service settings as we are doing here inside our API client it's basically injecting those information that's got from the app settings and the user secrets to this class so in order for us to access it I just wanted to clarify this point and how it's uh, how it's actually working in the background so now let us build the uh, application, uh, actually the function that's going to be connecting to the API. So first of all, we're going to be creating a client which is going to be responsible from connecting our application with that uh, coins API. So we're going to put var client equal new rest because we're going to install the rest shop. So we're going to be using the rest sharp API. So we're going to call it rest client. And basically we're going to be utilizing the coins URL so in order for us to access it directly all we need to do is let's put this inside a string so it will make it easy for us to adjust it and we're going to put settings dot coins price URL and this automatically will be populated because of the, our dependency instruction as, as we have discussed before and then if we look back at postman we can see that it's calling the forward slash ticker and we need to add this so let's go back here and add it here great so now this is our base url that we're going to be using let's us fix this perfect so after we have created the client now we need to create the request so we put var request equal new new rest request and basically we're just telling it that this method is going to be a get function and now what we're going to be also doing is we're going to telling it that if we look back at postman we can see that the response that we're getting is json so we need to tell it here that the request format is going to be json so we're going to put request dot request format equal data format dot json perfect so once we have done that all what's left is if we look back again to postman we need to add three parameters to our call which is the key the label and the fiat so first of all is the key so we're going to put request dot add parameters and we're going to be passing in the key and this parameter basically we're going to be getting it directly from the settings because we have already saved it in our user secrets so settings.api key and we're just going to give it the parameter type dot 
get or post. We don't really matter. It has to attach it for both. And then we're gonna let's duplicate this and update it as we need to. So copy because we have three. So the second one is gonna be label. We're just basically gonna tell it what type of data we want. We want Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin. So we're just gonna copy paste it directly from here because these are the three that we want. And lastly, we're gonna be selecting the currency, which is the fiat, and we're gonna paste it the currency that the function takes. So we're gonna change this to currency. Perfect. So once we have added that, the next step is gonna be actually doing the call. So var response equal client client dot get, and we're gonna send the request, and that's it. So right now, let us do a quick summary of what we did. So the first thing here is we initiated a Rusty client. And then we initiated the Rust request. And then after that, we added the parameters. So the request added the request parameters. And here we're actually doing the call, adding, calling the API with all of the request. Perfect. So once that client is going to go and do all of the requests, it's going to send us a response. So, but we need a way for us to process the response because basically it's going to return it for us in a text or a JSON format. But we need a way in order for us to utilize it. So previously, before .NET 5, if we we're going to do that, we needed to create classes and basically DTOs. And those DTOs will need to be mapped directly to those. And we need to do uh, a lot of like uh, matching between the JSON files and the classes that we have created in order for us to get that response. But luckily, within .NET 5, a new feature that got introduced, which was records. And records basically takes the complexity of creating a completely new class just in order for us to do all of these mappings. So let us create some records. And based on that records, we are able to uh, basically map to the response. And we can serialize the JSON object into the records that we want. So first, let us take a look at our response from Postman. As we can see, that that response is gonna it's again it's a JSON, and it has the markets here, and then inside that markets it's gonna have a list of an objects, and every object will have name, label, price, timestamp, and all of those. So it looks straightforward enough. So let us start creating those records. So first we're gonna start creating that market. So how do we do that? All we need to do is type public record and we're going to call it market and from every one of these market we're going to have for our use case right now it's going to be very simple all we're going to be utilizing is the label and i think name and price so string label string name and let's see the price the price is a double so we'll put the price uh, so double put a double and uh, we'll give it a price perfect so after that the next step for us it's gonna be basically adding the if let's look back and we can discuss so we have just defined this which is this object but we need a way in order for us to serialize all of the arrays so how do we do that it's also very simple so here let's add another record and this record is going to be public record coins info we're going to call it and basically it's going to be a market array and we're going to be calling it markets markets perfect so now we have our own uh, uh, our own coins info which is going to be representing this entire object and it's going to map to markets as we see here it's going to be an array of markets and every market is a record which is formed of three properties which is labels name and price which is very easy uh, to create so as you can see we ha only have two lines of code 
which save us the time to create a complete class which we're only gonna need in order for it to transfer objects from one point to another. So right now, since we already have this, the next step for us is let us serialize it. So var market equal JSON serializer. Again, we're utilizing the new serializer that's available with .NET 5. And let us fix this dependency. And then we're going to put dot deserialize. And we're going to be deserializing based on the coins info that we have just created. And then we're going to take the response dot content in order for us to do that. And lastly, what are we going to do is we're going to be returning this to the function which is calling it so we can put return to markets. And let's update our method so it will take benefit of that. So it's going to take coins info, so it's going to return coins info. So instead of void here, we're going to make it coins info and API client here as well to make it consistent. Let us fix these references. Okay, great. And here it's able to do that. Perfect. Let us build and see if everything still built as it should be. So dot not build. Okay, great. So right now we have created a services, which is an API client service which is going to be responsible to communicating with our application with the API. But how is dot not going to know about it? Again, the easiest way to do it is we have to add the injected into our startup. So how do we do that? Inside our configure services, all we need to do is type services and we're going to make it as a scope. So per request is going to add a scope for this method. So add scoped and we're gonna basically going to be injecting the I, act, uh, I API service with the API service. And now let us just fix the references. API service. Okay, what's maybe? Oh, sorry, it's called API client. I API client, and here it's called API client. I apologize for that. And using perfect. Now this reference has been fixed. So after we've done that. Uh, it's time for us to test it. But how are we going to test it? Let us create a controller where it's going to be utilizing all of this. And then we can actually see the test and we can respond. So we don't really need this anymore. So let's delete the default control that is provided. So delete. Yes. And inside our controller, we create a new class. And this class is going to be called coins market controller easy name and inside this controller inside so inside this class let us just add some configuration to it so the first thing is it's going to be an api controller okay let's add that uh, fix the references and second we're going to define the route and this is going to be again so controller great and then this is going to inherit from the controller base. Great, great. So once we have done that, now let's add our service, which is the API service that we're going to be utilizing. So it's going to be private, read only, I API client. We're going to call it API client. And let's us fix the references. And then after we do that, we're going to be adding the logger. So private read only I logger of coins. Excuse me if I can type uh, coins market controller and it's going to be logger. And let's fix the reference for this as well. OK, great. Now let's create the constructor and inside this constructor we're going to be utilizing first let's define this so we copy it and paste it here 
and instead of underscore put it logger and the other one is gonna be the i application sorry i api client api client and then inside the constructor is gonna be api client equal api client and similar to the logger underscore logger equal logger perfect let's save this and now let's create our get method so let's add the attribute http get let's define the route and basically the route is going to be very simple or we're going to pass to that get is the currency so we'll put currency and now let's define our actual action so public i action result and it's gonna be a get function very simple and then we're gonna be passing a string of it's called currency great and then it's very simple we're gonna be calling the api client so var result equal underscore api client to, to connect the api and we're gonna pass it the currency that we have passed great and once we do that all we need to do is we're gonna return an okay which is a 200 with the result okay i have a typo here so let's fix the typo perfect so let us build this application and see what do we have dot not build great now let's run it dot not run Before we actually see the response, I just want to mention one thing related to dot .NET 5. So previously to .NET 5, if we wanted to utilize Swagger, we had to install it separately to our application. But luckily, if we take a look first at our sample service.cs proj, we can see that the Swagger package has automatically been added for us when we created the application. And if we go to the startup class, we can see it has already been automatically configured for us inside our configured services method inside the startup class so all of the boilerplate template has been automatically added for us by the application so we don't really need to do any work so right now if we go to the browser and if we open localhost on port 5000 and we put forward slash swagger forward slash index.html we can see that uh, our controller has automatically popped up and we can actually directly test it from here so all we need to do is click on try it out and then it will give us the ability to pass the currency so let's say we want us dollars and we click on execute we can see that it has returned null so there's something wrong here so let us debug it let's go back here let's stop the application and let us put a breaking point on the controller and let's run it so we have to click on this one here the play button and let's click on the start so this will take a few seconds as well perfect now it's running on port 5000 again let's go back to swagger and basically let us execute this again so we can see the information is coming here usd correct now let's jump into it so we can see it's getting the client correctly yes it's building the request it's adding let's see if it's actually getting the api key oh that's the issue the api key is getting null but is it getting the actual redirect okay that's correct it's getting the right URL. So why is the API key null? Let us check that. So let's go to the terminal. So let us type dot net user dash secrets list. And we can see that it has been saved successfully here. So we can see service settings colon. Oh, we called it API. It should have been called let's see it here it should have been called API keys 
API key. So that's the issue. So let us fix that. It's also gonna be very simple. All we need to do is we're gonna be adding so dot net user dash secrets. It's gonna be set service settings service is wrong. service settings API key and then we're gonna actually pass the API key which is gonna be the same as this and let's paste it okay great and we, now we can see that it has saved service settings API key okay great now let us check it all again and we can see that it's getting the API key successfully let us try to run the application again and see if it's actually gonna work now let's go back to our web and let us execute it again and we can see that the response have come back successfully BTC, Ethereum and Litecoin with the actual prices now let's switch to for example GBP to the pound and we can see that we got the price in pound if we switch to BTC we found the price in Bitcoin or we can actually get the actual price in Bitcoin perfect so now we are 100% that our application is working as it should be. Now it's time for us to discuss how are we gonna make this application uh, less error prone and how are we gonna be able to handle if there's something went wrong because one of the main feature of microservices is they are reliable. And since right now we are de uh, depending on a third party service or third party API in order for us to get the information, we need a way that to make our service more reliable and in case the call has failed we want to automatically re-implement or redo that request again so how are we going to do that we're going to be basically using a microsoft extension called poly and once we add poly we're going to add some certain rules there so based on that it will automatically redo the call again in order for us to um, have a more reliable AP, uh, microservice so let's go back to our source code to our visual studio code let us stop this application and let's add the new package we're gonna put dot net add package and we're gonna call it microsoft dot extensions dot http dot poly this should take also like a few seconds to complete perfect and the next step is we're gonna be basically adding some configuration to our API client to uh, utilize poly. So let's go to our API client and just to give a quick overview on poly, first let us check if it has su in, uh, added successfully so we can see it here inside the package reference poly has been added. Perfect. And that's well, all we want to say is poly allow us to do some transient error policies. So basically what that means is uh, it's adaptable. So if something goes wrong, we are able to uh, do some error policies that's gonna basically for example retry the request again and it will allow us to define how do we want to handle those errors so let's try to implement it and we can see how we can uh, how it works from there and we can explain one by one how it works so the first thing is we're gonna be adding here is the uh, retry policies so let's go here and we create a list on top let's add a new command and we're gonna call it adding retry well oh, call it poly policies policies okay so far gonna call it retry policy equal policy let's fix the reference great and then we're gonna put dot handle result and basically since trust client is going to be returning an i rust response so we can put i rust response and we're going to be handling those results and in case the response is has invalid status code now we have to define what are these invalid status code so but let us first do this so invalid status code dot contain the rest 
uh, sorry, the response dot status code. So let us, before we do anything else, let's define those invalid status code. And the invalid status code basically is going to be a static list. So let's add it here and private static read only. It's going to be a list of HTTP status code. Let's fix those references. Let's continue and call it invalid status code. And now let's fix the references. Perfect. The other one. Okay, great. And this is going to be equal new list. And then basically we're going to be defining all of the HTTP status code that we might have. So it's going to be HTTP status code dot bad request. It's going to be HTTP status code dot bad, let's say, I don't know, bad gateway. HTTP status code dot internal server error. HTTP status code dot request timeout. Request. Okay. And then we're going to put the forbidden one. HTTP status code status code dot forbidden and let's add also the gateway timeout so http status code dot gateway timeout so basically let's do a quick summary of our doing here we're adding all of the status code that the http api might, might uh, that the api might give us back and if any of those uh, status code the http status code if the api actually returns it the retry policy that we have is going to capture it and basically the first line here is going to be comparing the response that we got from the api with this list and in case these matches what we're going to be doing is we're going to adding some rules and regulation to uh, to the retries so we're going to say if you actually get any of those status code you need to wait and retry and we're going to define right now how many times you want to retry so for now, we're just going to say you need to retine, uh, retry 10 times. And then here, we're going to be doing something called exponential back off. So what does that mean? An exponential back off means, so let's say the first time we did the request to the API and it failed. And we did it again directly. And then we did it again directly. So what we're doing now is we're just doing retries in the same uh, very fast uh, one uh, one after another in order for us to get the response which is first of all is gonna create a lot of load on the api and it might give us a uh, request uh, we have reached the limit of doing the request which we don't really want that what we want to do is we want to automatically add a few seconds every time we want to do a request so let's say we did the request first time to the application and it fails what we're going to do is we're going to wait a few seconds and then do another request and then if it fails again we're going to add more seconds and we're going to request again so it's an incremental or exponential back off so how do we do that it's very simple we're going to put i so time span dot from seconds let's fix uh, those references great and then basically we're going to be using the math dot pow which is the power of two with i so two seconds this is the number of uh, seconds we want to await and i is the number of retries so one is going to be two to the power one two two to the power two three to the power three and so on and so forth and this will allow us not to overwhelm the api and actually do all of these response as we go at the retries as we go second uh, basically we're just going to now uh, create our uh, delegate function and how are we going to be managing this so it's going to be a result it's going to be an anonymous function it's going to be timestamp time span current retry round retry count and lastly the context and then from there we're going to create from there we're going to create a anonymous function 
and basically within that anonymous function we can we are just for now we are just gonna be just displaying stuff to the logger so it's gonna be logger i will call it logger right oh we didn't add a log we'll add log logger now before we do anything let's put it here so it's gonna be basically a uh, private read only i logger api action we're gonna call it logger uh, let us fix those references perfect api clients why do i say action okay and now let's copy this and inside the constructor uh, let's name this logger and then underscore logger equal logger great so now here all we need to do is we're just gonna add the log error so dot log error and we're gonna say let's use a string concatenation request has failed and we're gonna show the status code with a so that's gonna be the result dot result dot status code and we're gonna say how much are we gonna be waiting so waiting I think this is gonna be basically the time span of how are we gonna wait how much are we gonna wait so time span and say before oh, next retry and we're gonna just display the retry um, uh, so finally this is the and we're just gonna add the current retry count this is the retry yes, that should be fine and yeah this should be it let's add a semicolon at the end and everything is that should be perfect so let us just do a quick uh, summary of what we did here before we move any further so the first thing is we have uh, added the package uh, poly which is an extension from microsoft for us to do this after we have added that uh, policy uh, sorry that package we added a new policy and this policy is basically saying if inside uh, in case uh, any i rest response which is the uh, the rest api uh, the rest sharp response inside this rest response if the http code that we're getting is invalid and we specified of a list of all of the invalid http uh, status code so let's add a comment here list of invalid http status code so in in case the status code matches any of this we're gonna doing the following we're gonna wait uh, we're gonna do 10 retries and then we're gonna be waiting this amount of time so for the first time it's gonna be two seconds and then we're gonna be actu actually redoing the same call all over again so how do we and then in case it fails we're just adding a logger here so that's about it so how are we gonna implement this again it's very simple we're gonna basically utilizing the retry policy so first we're gonna see put var policy response equal we're going to be utilizing the retry policy dot execute and capture so that means that within uh, the parameters that we're going to add right now we're going to be executing the action that we want that the retry policy is going to be working against so it's going to be as before an anonymous function and then from here we're going to create the response that we want or we can actually directly put return client dot get and we're gonna pass it the request as simple as that and let's close it from here so this line here basically instead of directly calling the client as we have here we're just calling it inside this retry policy so in case it actually fails this will work all over again in order for us to 
be able to uh, repeat that request as many times as we have, which is 10 times before it fails. So after we do that, we need to check the response result. So also we put if policy response dot result. If it's not null, basically we're just gonna be uh, serial deserializing it and return it back to the user. So if it's not null, not any, if it's not null, else we're just gonna be returning null. Return null. Okay, so let's copy this. and paste it here and instead of having the response that contacts is gonna be policy response dot results dot content and that way and let's delete this or let's say yeah, let's remove these we don't need them anymore okay great 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 and we can make this even simpler by directly returning it And we don't need this. Okay, great. Okay. Let us test this and see if it's working. First, let us build the application dot not build. This will take a few seconds. Perfect. Now dot not run. Great. Now it's running on the same port. So let's go back to our web browser and let us execute it again. Perfect, now we can see it's actually working. One thing we're gonna do right now is let us turn off the internet so the application will not be able to work and we can see, uh, and let's see what happens. So execute, we can see how it has failed. And if we put it back and we execute, we can see it has worked. Perfect. So that was it now uh, let's go to the next step inside our code is which is adding some health checks into our application so what are health checks health checks are basically um, it's a middleware that microsoft provide for us in order to check if our application is behaving as it should be so let's say we have decided to deploy this microservice within kubernetes uh, Kubernetes will be able to uh, query the health checks API inside our service to make sure if it's running successfully. If it's not running successfully inside the container uh, within Kubernetes, it will basically shut down that container and restart it again so the application is running as it should be. So it's a really good way for us to know if the application is uh, working as it should and if it's not it's uh, it tells uh, kubernetes or any other hosting service provider that it should restart the container that's being hosted on so how do we utilize health checks first of all all we need to do is go to the startup class and inside our uh, services we need to add a reference to it so services dot add health checks so that's the first thing we want to add and then we need to add an endpoint so so we, that endpoint is going to be used for us to check if the application is running as it should be so here inside the endpoints we're going to put endpoints dot map health checks and then we're going to put health or we can put forward slash yeah let's put forward slash health this is basically the URL for it. And right now, let's test this out. So uh, inside our terminal, let's stop the application and let's run it again. So dot not run. It's building. Perfect. Oh, now let's go to our web browser again and let's copy. No need to copy. We'll put localhost, localhost 5000 forward slash health. And we should see right now healthy. Perfect, that was the outcome. But right now, this healthy uh, response that we have got, it's only uh, for the application itself. So uh, only for the actual service. So the service is healthy because it's running. But we don't really know if it's healthy actually because our service depends on a third party 
API. And with, in order for us to give that healthy response, we need to make sure that the API is actually working as it should be. So how do we do that? Also, uh, it's very easy. What we need to do is first inside our root folder, we need to create a new folder and yeah, we'll call it uh, health checks. And inside the health check folder, we're going to create a new class. And we're going to call this class coins info health check. And we're going to be basically implementing the I health check interface. And let's fix the references. And then we're going to be implementing this interface. Perfect. So basically what we're going to be doing here is uh, we're going to be pinging uh, the API that we have and we can see if we can able to get a response. And if we are actually able to get a response, it means that the service is healthy. Great. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be adding the service settings so we can get the API URL. Uh, yeah, let's do that. So private. read only service settings underscore settings and let's define let's fix the references and then we can define a constructor so we'll put ctor and then here uh, we're gonna be basically using the i options service settings settings and then it's going to be, let's also fix those references. Great. Service settings. This should be fine. Uh, oh, we did it outside the class. I apologize. So let's do it here. Yes, that's more like it. And here, let's put underscore settings. Equal settings. Great. The next step is we're going to be actually uh, defining the health checks. Where is it? Oh, sorry, settings.value. Now we need to build our health check. So we're going to be utilizing the ping command. Ping. Ping. Equal new. So this is another new feature with .NET 5. So let's first fix this. So previously, before this, it used to be something like this ping ping equal new ping um, so this is also straightforward so basically here we are defining a variable ping and we're initializing a new one a feature of dotnet 5 is in order for us to save time uh, because we basically we're just defining the same instance here uh, we don't really need to put the new ping command here. So all we need to do is just define the new and the parentheses and we'll automatically initialize it. So it's simpler and just for readability, it has been added, I think, uh, but it's, it's a nice feature to have and it's really appreciated. So after that, let's uh, check our URL. So var URL, this is the URL of our application. So one thing that I want to mention here is that some uh, applications will allow us directly to ping their domain and some of them will not allow us to ping it unless we ping directly the IP so in order for us to check this uh, I did the test before and that current one that we're using which is the coin index uh, this domain itself here which is the uh, world coin index will not allow us to ping directly the domain so we need to ping the IP so what we need to do is let's go back to Google and let's add get IP of website and we can get the IP and we can add it here but other websites I'm sure they are able to we can directly ping the domain so IP info check let's use this one and let's copy this so we can directly paste it here and get the IP so let's put this domain and put check uh, let's Put all of the traffic lights, perfect. Mountains or hill, okay, mountains, mountains, mountains or hills. Okay, great, check. Okay, 
Okay, it's not working. Let's just find another website. Uh, let's check this one. Okay, let's paste it here and find IP. Okay, great. That's the IP address that uh, this has an error. Why is it giving an error? So let's put in. Oh, we had added this at the end. Find IP. Perfect. We got the IP address. Let's use this one. And let's go back to our application and go here and we'll paste the IP address. Great. So after that, we're going to just defining the reply. Equal await ping dot send ping async. And we're just going to be sending the URL. And this is an await. So let's put here, make it as an async function. Great. And all we need to do right now is to check if this is actually working. So we're going to put if reply dot status. It's not equal to IP status dot success. So basically the ping has failed. We're going to return unhealthy. Return. Health. check result dot unhealthy and else we're going to return healthy so return health check result dot healthy great 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 so once we have done that all we need to do is stop the application and then once we stop the application let us restart it again and let's wait for it Great, now let's go back to our web browser and let us query this again. And we can see, oh, we missed one step, which is a really important step. Let's go back to our code at here, let's stop it. What we need to do right now is we need to uh, add this health check to our startup class. So let's go to our startup class. And inside the services here, we need to append this new health check. So from here, we'll put dot add check and then we can put the coins i think coin info coins info health check yeah let's fix the reference great and then we're gonna give this a name uh this should be here i apologize and this will give it a name gonna call it coins and point and point okay great and now we have we have attached the new health check to our services health check. So now the middleware know that we have an extra health check that we need to do other than the service itself. Let us run the application again. And let us go to our web browser and refresh this. And we can say we are getting the healthy. Perfect. So if we right now, for example, cut off the internet. Although our service is still running, but there is no connection to it. We should get right now an unhealthy because it's not able to ping that request. See, we have got here the response unhealthy, but if we connect back to the internet, let's take a few seconds. Great, and now we refresh. It have come healthy because it's able to ping that IP address. Okay, great, great. So this is uh, basically the health check stuff that we want to cover within this video. And the last point that I would like to mention is let's go back to our code editor and it's going to be basically how are we going to be differentiating with the output of the logs if we are actually in production or if we are in development mode. So let's go to our program.cs class and here let us add some conditioning for the for the logging that has been only introduced within .NET 5 so uh, it will facilitate our work. So first let's go to let's add dot configure logging and then here we're just gonna pass the context and the logging and we'll create a function and basically we're gonna for now we're gonna output the logs into the console into json so logging dot add json console perfect so now let's stop this application 
and let us run it again and as we can see here automatically we are, and we saw that after the application has started and it's building we, can, we are able to see the responses that we have are in JSON format if we comment this out and save it and then stop the application and run it again we can see we are getting it right now in a normal info and uh, normal uh, console output but once we have enabled the JSON uh, uh, console response we are seeing in a JSON format this is really helpful in production because again if we're using this service within Kubernetes I'm sure we're gonna have like a, a logging service that's gonna be able to take these logs out of these containers and then sending them to these local servers in order for us to monitor them and this is this case is usually with any hosting provider but within Kubernetes it's really good to have those because basically it will allow us to monitor the containers and their behavior and if we're going to be outputting them this way it will be a bit more harder for us to process these logs when it comes to our uh, logging service that we have but if we are outputting as JSON JSON is way more easier to parse so in order for us to only enable those in JSON what we need to do is within this function here we're gonna add the following if environment is production so basically we're saying if this application is running in production all we need to do is we're gonna log this output in JSON so first of all we're gonna clear all of the previous output so it means that we're not gonna be logging to any anything else so we're gonna put logging dot clear provider so this way we're saying it do not show any uh, logs and then we're gonna say it okay only show loggings in JSON so add JSON console and that means it's only gonna output the errors in JSON only for production environment and yeah this is it so this just uh, there's gonna be another video within the upcoming uh, week or so related to kubernetes how we can set it up how are we gonna initiate a a local version of kubernetes how are we gonna be utilizing minute cube cube control how are we gonna be able to sync the logs so this will allow us to directly uh, see the application uh, see the logs directly from this application into our kubernetes and this video should coming out uh, should be coming up within the next week or so thank you thank you very much uh, for watching this video uh, so just in case you made it this far please add a comment just saying that uh, the comment which says say chocolate and this way I know that you have already made it to the end of the video and you have watched it all uh, thanks again for watching uh, thank you for your feedback um, please write any question that you have in the comments down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can have a great day